<laughs> oh, hello. I am Reginald Rasopitan, and today on Wake Up, Shmelda, we go down a culinary trail of orange chicken and vegetable stir fry. Won't you join me? Good day. Oh, banana hammock! It's important to remember that we're trying to multitask as we go in the kitchen. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start the rice. So, what I've got here is one and a half cups of water, one cup of rice. We're going to put that into a small pot and put that on up front. So, I've also got a blanch pot started on the back right that is going to go on high to bring it up to a boil. The rice I'm going to put between medium and high to get it started. And when that water starts to, we'll call it boil, but the bubbles start to show, we want to turn it back to a simmer until all that water goes away. And the rice gets one tablespoon of salt, and the blanch pot gets a lot of salt. We want it to taste like salt water. There are two primary techniques in what we know as stir-frying, chow and bao. I apologize if I mispronounce it. I don't mean any disrespect. I'm trying my best at it. So I believe it is chow and bao. Now bao uses more oil, and it's kind of if you've seen at a restaurant where they use a lot of oil and make a kind of fryer in the wok and have that turbo jet engine underneath of it. And the ingredients get crispy from what we know as the Maillard reaction, which is if you've ever steered a steered, <laughs> seared a steak and you get that nice crisp on the outside, or when you cook bread, you get that nice crust on the outside. It's changing the amino acids in the ingredients and your product to get a nice different flavor from baking it or hitting it hard on your pan. Now, chow is kind of what we call sautéing, and it is softer ingredients that all get put into one pot, and a liquid is added. We're going to have a sauce, which is our liquid for today. So, let's start out with our chicken. I have tenderloins and cornstarch. The cornstarch is added to make the chicken crispy when it hits the pan. It helps dry out and keep in all the juices. Dry out and keep out all the juices. That's a dumb way to say it. I should say it seals in all the juices. It's the same thing you would do if you were trying to fry the chicken. And of course we'll need salt and pepper. We're going to cube these and then dredge them in cornstarch. Then for our sauce, we're going to have orange both zest and juice. We want it to be a tad bit sweet. And we're going to add ginger, because ginger and orange go together very, very well. Now we need to add a little bit of vinegar flavor to it as well. So we have rice vinegar. The soy sauce will help us with umami or the uh, kind of richness of it. We need some sweetness. That is our honey. And garlic, because we use garlic in everything, right? <laughs> And then we go into our vegetables. I just have an assortment here, and we'll go over some knife techniques with each one. But I wanted to get color and crispness and just general flavors. And so there's a, there's a wide assortment. I have mushrooms, zucchini, broccoli, some Brussels sprouts, and two peppers and some asparagus. 
Uh, you can pick and choose whatever you want or whatever you may have around the house. It's good. You can use spinaches, kales, anything so like that. So it goes without saying, you need to wash your hands before and after you handle chicken. And we're going to first slice it down the middle. And I usually put the tip of the knife right onto the board and kind of pull it through as opposed to a push forward or all knife blade form of doing it like that. That is what I like to do on the other way as you're dicing it is skinny to fat end. But slicing we come through with just that tip end and pull it all the way through. So I'm going for a medium dice. Medium dice is good so you can control some of the temperature. You don't want to overcook it and make it dry. And speaking of dry, if you don't want dry fried chicken, stir fried chicken, any kind of chicken or product really that you're putting in uh, meat or poultry or something like that. You want to put cornstarch on the outside. That really helps seal in all of the juices and it also dries just the outside so it gets crispy on the outside and stays juicy on the inside. So the next time you do fried chicken or any kind of fried anything like that, try some scorn starch, <laughs> some corn starch on the outside. And again, wash your hands before and after people, please. Now we need to work our sauce. So first off, we're going to use fresh oranges. I really like fresh oranges, especially in recipes like this. Not, not opposed to using orange juice. If that's what you want to use, use that. That's absolutely fine. But the zest is also important. Now I didn't have a zester. We have one, but we took it to work and accidentally forgot it there. So I wanted to show you, you can actually just use a peeler. Peel off the outside. Try not to get very much of the white. You're not going to not get any white of, of that. That's bitter. But if you get some of it, it's okay. So as you see, a pinch grip and go from skinny to fat. And also when I do smaller, I guess chop is what you would say, kind of chop or mince, I like to do kind of one finger to hold that skinny end down as opposed to just jamming it up and down and messing up that blade. And you still kind of go skinny to fat while keeping it nice and steady with your one finger on the skinny end and slice an orange in half. I like to do between top and bottom. And I do not have a juicer, but what I do have is many, many, many strainers and lots of measuring cups. So I just put the smallest strainer I had, fine one, as long as it's fine enough to get rid of the seeds, you're fine. Which coincidentally, these were seedless, so it wasn't as important. But I think even sometimes with seedless, you run into one or two. But now we need to add the zest to the orange. We're not cooking yet. We're just getting everything set and put into one nice container. And then we will run through our other flavors. So first off, sweet. The original recipe actually called for a hoisin sauce, but I wanted to go slightly sweeter. So there's your sweet with honey. And the rice vinegar adds a layer of acidic to it on top of the the oranges and you want that to cut through and, and help uh, kind of let's say amplify some of the flavor flavors sorry and then the soy sauce I had was low sodium remember anytime you can get low sodium in some of these the better because low sodium lets you control the salt as opposed to it controlling the salt also it's better for your just general health and that is for the umami, as I said before. I, I think I'm correct in saying it's more of the boldness and kind of savory flavor that you're, you're looking for. And I did not have fresh garlic, so... Sorry, fresh ginger. The garlic, I buy the jars as always. Like I said, if you want to do cloves, absolutely fine. Don't get any hate for getting jars of it. That's just, just fine. So I needed to convert fresh to dry ginger. I didn't have fresh, it's a teaspoon of fresh, but if you do some research, you'll find that it's about a sixteenth or a sixth of dried to 
fresh depending on what herb you're doing. So I did basically a pinch of it, but I wanted a measurement, so I did half of an eighth, so a one sixteenth teaspoon of ginger. And then we need to put that on, and medium heat is what I went for so it didn't boil and make those sugars nasty. So this recipe has a lot of different cutting techniques, so I, I would like to put a lot of focus on this part of the video. So, pinch grip as always. And with peppers, I like to get that knife barely through the top, and you spin it with your hunter, other, other hand, and that way you can almost twist cap the top off, getting minimal waste, but getting rid of almost all that seed and core that you don't want at all. And do not worry, I have a trash can to the right of me. I'm not just dropping these things on the floor. So, we need to slice through the bottom part, and we're going to slice this into two sides. Again, as always, when I can, I use just the skinny end of the tip, the tip of the knife, skinny end of the knife. And with all juliennes, we go skinny to fat. And we're trying to use as much of that blade as always, not mashing down on it to get rid of that nice edge we've worked on. So here's rib removal on peppers. I'm going up and down, even though it seems like I'm kind of pushing left to right. This is how you don't chop your fingers off in a nutshell. So be careful with this technique and practice as much as you can on it. But what again we're doing is up and down motions and letting the knife do most of the work as opposed to forcing your hand left to right as hard as you can. So now we need to go back to Julian. Pinch grip, skinny to fat. See, we're sliding it through. I like to always say it looks like, you know how old trains on their wheels just have that kind of motion that goes through to keep them rolling. That's what I always imagine when I'm, I'm julienning things. Skinny to fat, as much knife blade as we can. Again, don't ruin that blade. We work so hard on sharpening that thing. And do it to one, do it to all. As you see through these videos, I kind of have a left to right for myself because I am right-handed. And usually I would use a bowl scraper for this. Be careful when you're using a knife to kind of uh, spatula it into a container. Here we go with a squash. So top and bottom. Showing you fat to skinny and skinny to fat ways of the knife. Again, not just straight down. And here we go again with that slide through. So tip of the knife is down. I'm pulling it towards myself. I'm letting the knife do all of the work. I'm barely pulling back on it. I'm not trying to jam it towards myself, making sure I don't take my fingers off. And I'm only taking off the outside of the zucchini because I don't want to bring any seeds into the picture. So again, do it to one, do it to all. We move everything to one side. And we're again doing that pull through. Skinny end of the, the knife there, pull through. One more time, going for a medium dice again because I'm trying to match up all the sizes of things that I'm going to be sauteing. So they all cook at the same speed, if you will, to the, to the same toughness at the end. And here, I, I don't know why I've chosen every single different way to put it into the container, but now I'm just using my hands. So, asparagus, or asparagi, I don't know what the plural is. Uh, so, you see the woody part at the bottom? What you do is line them up, snap a couple to see where that snaps easily, pinch grip, skinny to fat, push through, and we do it right where it snaps, so we get rid of all that tough part. This is a bias cut, or a diagonal slice. We're doing the same thing we always do with julienne. We're trying to keep it all the same size, and we have a slight angle to it. So it, it just basically makes it look fancy. You could do regular rods if you wanted, but bias cut is always done in these kitchens, so I like to do it here too. This is a paring knife. It is a beautiful piece of equipment. It is a tiny knife that helps you with things like mushrooms. Now I have washed and scrubbed these. And what I'm doing is kind of the same thing I did with the other stuff, is a pull through with the skinny end of the knife. And this way you're not using this big honking knife on this tiny thing and potentially taking your fingers off. So into another container we go. Brussels sprouts. I think that's how you say it, Brussels sprouts. We want to take off the bottom part. Pull through, but don't pull it completely through to your finger. Again, you're kind of sliding the knife, not just trying to 
uh, pinch it to your thumb because then you'll cut your thumb. And as you see, I'm getting rid of the outer leaves. I will use this for a dinner later on in the week, uh, just the leaves with some onions. And we're slicing through and slicing through again to make quarters because, again, we're trying to match this up with our zucchini that we did earlier so everything cooks the same. And the broccolini, too. They all want it to be the same size, cook the same, be the same toughness and tenderness when we go through. With broccoli florets, we're just going to clip as close as we can to the top without just making it fall into a million pieces. And the over, over going theme is always cut everything the same size, do it to one, do it to all. That's what we're always working on. These want to be the same size as the Brussels, as the same size as the zucchini, and so on and so forth. And you remember our chicken was fairly s uh, similar in size. So these guys will now go ahead and blanch with the Brussels leaves that we, Brussels, sorry, sprouts that we have quartered. I feel like we've gone over it before, but I will reiterate every single time you want a shock bath in the blanching process. So remember, either ice cubes or I use a home chef a uh, big block of ice to get the water super cold to stop the cooking process. And with both the broccoli and the Brussels, I did a minute and a half in boiling hot, boiling hot, in boiling water with salt in it. And that is your opportunity to salt and flavor your things. So salt your water. Really, really salt your water. And again, for mine, it was a minute and a half. You may want to test yours out. It, short of just pulling a piece out and eating it as it cools down to see the tenderness is, is what I can give you. Or if you want to run a knife through it, like your paring knife. You can push it through, and if it goes through with some ease, with a little resistance, that's what you're looking for. Not mushy, not hard. And again, we're going to hit it into the ice bath, which is to stop the cooking process and also to keep that nice, beautiful color you've worked on, to not overcook it so it's a kind of brown or loses just the nice colors and nutrients. And so we strain it out and let that dry. So it is firing time, and we're going to turn this up to medium-high heat. Let that pan get hot. Then we add the oil to the hot pan. Let the oil get hot. And you will see here next that the consistency we want is water-like. It looks like there's water in that pan. That is, in fact, oil. That is oil right before smoking point, and that is the perfect, perfect time to start putting in your chicken. So you get nice crispy outside, seal those flavors on the inside, again with that cornstarch. And this is the Maillard reaction in uh, its purest form. You're making a nice crispy outside and changing the consistency and complexity on the outside. So that's your chicken browned. I don't want to cook it too long to make it uh, dry. So as I showed you before, I have a container for the sauce. I'm going to add sauce to each one of these layers after I push it to the outside, drop ingredients in. We'll salt and pepper each one. With mushrooms, we need high heat as well to get all that water out. So that's those two together. And then we will salt and pepper. <laughs> I forgot what I did there. And push out to the outside again after we sauce. Again, don't use all that sauce at one point. You want each one to get their own salt, their own pepper, their own sauce. You salt and do it to each thing. Now, we're going to turn the temperature down because we're going to go into lighter ingredients that don't need to be hit so hard in your pan, like our squash and, or sorry, our zucchini and asparagus. I'm doing those straight up without blanching because when all this gets together, they will be just nice and crisp but cooked enough that they're not raw. Sauce them as well. And as you can see, I am pushing everything to the outside after each uh, thing has been cooked and sauced. And I'm using a rubber spatula. Rubber spatulas on Teflon and nonstick are what you need to do so you don't scratch up that nice pan of yours. Le not last, next to last, is the peppers. They are tender, but not quite as hard as the other things. Again, try to order each thing from toughness to lightness. Salt, pepper that, toss it, and 
sauce it again. And then now, last but not least, we got Brussels and broccolini. And I'm not even joking. All you want to do is barely hit it and pretty much warm it up because you've already cooked it through the blanching process. So salt, pepper, and sauce. And this is a nice shot of everything all together with a better camera. I'm going to work on that down the road so it's not such a fuzzy one there when I'm cooking. You get to see the actual product. So what I've done is kind of preemptively off camera made a nice sticky rice ball for looks and purposes. Uh, in the end, I think it kind of goes away after everything gets into it. So it's not as pretty as I wanted it to be. But hey, we're at home. We're not trying to make fancy plates for people at restaurants. So... Spooning in each thing, as always, we spoon and kind of move the spoon away so you're controlling exactly where it is landing as opposed to just dropping it into a bowl. And what I've done also is taken some peanuts and smashed them and taken some scallions and sliced them. I also bought a sauce. It's just a peanut sauce. I thought it would go well. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't let people hate on you again for buying a sauce to put on something you've worked on. Try to take as many steps as you can to, to do homemade, but also not as homemade. We all got things to do. So in the end, this doesn't look exactly as pretty as I wanted it to, but it's the peanuts, the scallions, the sauce on top. And the end product is okay, not as pretty as I wanted it, but hey man, still good. Alright, now it's time to try it. I didn't have the microphone on the first time, but I remember this time. Mmm. I like the citrus in it a lot. Aren't you glad I didn't make a corny joke? <laughs> He's just the worst. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I'll see you again next time. Thank you as always. Yeah, came. Yeah, saute. You conquered. <laughs>